thank you for inviting me. It's uh, an honor to be here. And uh, so uh, PJ said that um, I should spend some of this time reviewing uh, or telling you how I got to where I wa am today and why I got interested in the science that I do. <coughs> and uh, so I thought I would start with one of my earliest scientific memories, and that is my father's laboratory. My father uh, was a biochemistry professor at the University of Michigan. And this is a picture of me sitting at my father's desk, uh, I think two or three years old. And that device on the table that's washed out from the photograph is PJ's laughing, <laughs> is a slide rule, <laughs> the earliest pocket calculator. Uh, so I was, uh, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where my father went for a job at the University of Michigan. And Ann Arbor was a spectacular place to grow up. I had no idea until I went away to college that the kind of diversity that you have at a university was abnormal. We had people from all <coughs> over the world coming through our house, my father's students. We had people from many different cultures my mother worked in the School of Education and got a PhD there in special education. And at a very early age, uh, I had exposure to people who were deaf. And in fact, in my high school, one of my best friends was a woman who was deaf. She was, she lip read, had hearing aids. Um, and I thought that was completely normal until I went away to school in Chicago and realized nobody had that kind of experience in the people that I met. So one of the reasons that I loved growing up in a university environment and have spent my entire career in universities uh, is the ability to celebrate diversity. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how I got from there to here. Growing up in a university environment, uh, I was of course, very interested in uh, new and shiny things. And one of the newest and shiniest things was, were computers. Now, I am ancient enough that I learned how to program a computer on punch cards. <laughs> so you had to sit down and type out every single card. And the cards were in a stack. And of course, because I was a university brat, I could use my father's university computer account. So when I was 13 years old, <laughs> I started learning how to program a computer. And these are the first two computers as devices that I learned how to program aside from the big university computer. And uh, so that was a computer that was on a single board. And the Altair was the first home computer. These buttons right here, they're switches. Before you could do anything with the computer, you had to flip the switches and then flip a single switch, one at a time, to put the computer program that allowed you to use a keyboard into the computer. 
So part of what I grew up with was using computers from a very early age and of course my interest in science from being around my father's laboratory. My brother and I spent lots of time in my father's laboratory. My father was a chemist, so occasionally it would get very exciting when one of his colleagues had a chemical reaction that went bad and exploded in the laboratory next door. Really exploded, like <laughs> glass flying everywhere ruined the laboratory. Um, but I didn't, I also loved uh, thinking about ideas. And so initially, I wanted to be a philosopher. I thought that would be great. Now, I'm sure you all, all have parents that have definite ideas about what you should do with your life. It turns out my father's idea from when I was that three-year-old was that I should go to medical school. And when I informed him when I was 17 and starting to look at colleges that I wanted to be a philosophy major, he said, there are minus two jobs a year in philosophy. <laughs> I'm not having you live at home until you're 50 years old, which would be about now. <laughs> he said, you need to figure out a way to go to medical school and then you can do anything that you want. And I thought, he's crazy. <laughs> but as I started to do more mathematics and science in school and got interested in computers, I started reading about the philosophy of science and I thought, well, you know, maybe this medical school thing wouldn't be so bad. One day I was looking through Grey's Anatomy, not the TV show, <laughs> the actual book, <laughs> and I saw this picture, which is the cross section of a bone a femur. And look at how the bone arches and is woven together. And I thought that that was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. Now, of course, I was kind of an odd kid. You know, you're in high school and you see this and uh, you think, wow, that's really beautiful. But I wanted to know how that happened? How did you get those patterns in bone? So I decided that if I was going to go to uh, medical school or do something medical, you know, my father was, have to go to medical school, have to go to medical school. I thought I would study mechanical engineering because I like math, I like working with computers, and I would study biomechanics. And maybe I could do orthopedics. So the theme of this talk is that there is no one true path. And you can already see I'm zigzagging. OK, philosopher, biomechanical engineer, maybe orthopedic surgeon. And you'll see a bunch of those zigzags. In high school, I actually got involved in the science fair. And it's now called, I think, the Intel Science Fair. Back then, it was the uh, General Motors uh, Science and Engineering Fair. Um, and I competed in the science fair every year during high school. And my last year of high school, with a project that involved orthopedics, I won the International Science and Engineering Fair, and I got to go to the Nobel Prize ceremonies in Stockholm, and it was in 1981, and I sat there and watched the ceremony, and I didn't have the thoughts that you might imagine 
you know, that I really want this. This is what I want to do with my career. I sat there and I thought, this is spectacular, but I could be really happy just doing science, not with some big prize or ceremony. And that was really a lesson for me. So I went to Northwestern University and I got into a program that was biomedical engineering. So I could study that bone. And uh, it was what was called a seven-year medical program. So I was accepted into medical school at the beginning, but I had to do three years of undergraduate work. And I minored in philosophy. So I got to be a little bit of a philosopher. <laughs> and uh, then I applied also to the MD-PhD program. So in that program, you get uh, a PhD degree. So you go to medical school for two years. And at that point, that was two years of classroom work. And then you do your PhD in the laboratory, four years. And then you go back to medical school for two years and do your clinical rotations. So already it was going to be 11 years of training at Northwestern. So I was accepted into the MD-PhD program and I thought, okay, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. I have my degree in biomechanics. I had already published a paper in orthopedics. And I went to a lecture my freshman year in medical school by one of the professors there who studied how cells move with time-lapse photography. And Gunther was one of the brightest and most cultured people I had ever met. He was trained as a physicist. He was German. And when he spoke of science, he spoke of poetry and beauty and mathematics and looking for the truth. And I was young and idealistic, and I really liked that. <laughs> so now he studied how cells moved. And I thought, you know what? I don't, I don't care that this doesn't have very much to do with orthopedics. I want to learn from this person. And for me, that was one of the most important lessons of my career was don't be rigid. You're going to find opportunities that you love, something that excites you, a person that you think, I really want to learn from that person. So change. There is no one true path. So I did a PhD in cell biology. And I studied how cells move. Now, part of that PhD, I went to boot camp for scientists at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. It's on Cape Cod. That's actually what the institute looks like, that set of buildings with sailboats. The dormitory that I stayed in was right here for an entire summer. And that was really exciting because there were people from all over the world and some really famous scientists. Uh, I met Jim Watson of Watson and Crick. Um, and I met um, the son 
of Albert St. Georgi. So this is the uh, saying that was above the entrance to the library at Woods Hole. Study nature, not books. And I like that. Albert St. Georgie discovered how muscles work and the proteins in muscles. And he had a house that was out on the point that looked over Cape Cod and all the students would, in the summer course, would go at night and invade his private beach <laughs> and swim in the ocean. Uh, and he would chase the students off his property with a shotgun. <laughs> but here by the sea, we had discussions about everything, about biology, about art, about culture. Many of the scientists were musicians. There were concerts about every other night. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. That summer, the uh, Titanic had been discovered and filmed. And uh, the person who led the discovery of the Titanic came to Falmouth, which is the town near Woods Hole, and in the high school auditorium showed us the first public footage of the Titanic. So it was a magical summer. I was learning science, I was with smart people, I was learning cell biology, thinking about marine biology, which I had no idea about. So then I spent the next four years in the laboratory studying how cells move. But during my graduate coursework, I started to learn about the immune system and immunology and I fell in love with immunology. But I still had to finish my PhD in cell biology. So I did, and I loved what I did. And then I went back to medical school and finished the last two years of medical school. And I thought at that point, I was going to be a pathologist. So here's another zigzag. You're probably thinking, this guy has no idea what he wants to do. <laughs> and then I discovered something. I hated autopsies, <laughs> did not like them at all, and I loved the way of thinking that people who did internal medicine used. There was a professor who we would have what they called stump the professor rounds. And they would talk about a patient who was sick and the medical students and the residents would present the details and the lab results and they would hide things from him, the professor, and try and mislead him. And he would go up to the board and list the possibilities of what that person might have as an illness. And then we would go and see the patient and he would ask the three most critical questions and without fail, tell us what the patient had. So here was another teacher and I thought, if I could do that by the time I finished my medical training, that would be worthwhile. So I decided to do internal medicine. And that started my medical career. 
So these are the ID cards from all the medical centers that I had worked at. So there's one from the University of Michigan. That's me at 18 when I was still doing uh, one summer orthopedic research and programming computers to uh, reconstruct x-rays of bone so you could see that pattern of bone that I showed you. It's my identification card from Northwestern. So then for my medical training, I went to Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. And I trained in internal medicine. And got to be surrounded by people who not only were doing medicine, but doing research. And I still like thinking about really complex problems. So I thought, okay, I want to do immunology. I'm not so interested in the orthopedic part anymore. And I'll be a rheumatologist because that will give me lots of time in the laboratory. So again, I thought, okay, I'll get lots of immunology. I'll have time for my research. This is perfect. I had this idea of how the world was going to work. And of course, I found out that I didn't find rheumatology very interesting. And one of my residents said, you should become a transplant nephrologist, a kidney doctor. I love the intensive care unit because you got to think about really sick people with really complicated problems. And he said, you get to take care of those people. And you get to do all this fancy immunology that's associated with kidney transplants. So I stopped interviewing for rheumatology training and went to talk to the director of the nephrology program, the kidney training program. And they offered me a spot with the ability to spend two years in the laboratory. And that's how I ended up as a transplant immunologist. I've taken care of people with kidney transplants for um, 18 years at Rochester. I came to Rochester after a year in Boston, after I finished all my training. Uh, including all the training from college through when I finished my medical training. It was 17 years. My wife said I couldn't do any more training if I wanted to stay married. <laughs> <laughs> so I came here and uh, I was fortunate enough to have a grant from the National Institute of Health that allowed me to uh, begin my own laboratory and to study how cells in the immune system attack kidney transplants and also then respond in various ways to infections and vaccinations. But I had this love of computer programming and mathematics. And so part of what my laboratory does is not only to do the experiments that look at these things and ask these questions, but to do computer modeling and to create these mathematical models that describe how the immune system works. And also describe how the healthcare system works. It turns out the mathematics are the same. So now I'm going to show you a little bit 
of the work I do in the laboratory. So my laboratory, my research, I have, I really have uh, uh, two research groups. One of them studies immune responses to vaccination. So we do these complicated studies where we ask, how do people respond to the flu vaccine? Right? How many people here got the flu vaccine this year? Ooh, pretty good. A lot of people who didn't get it. Next year when we do a study, if you still haven't gotten the flu vaccine, you can come and participate in our study. We love people who, uh, the people in my laboratory call flu vaccine virgins. <laughs> Never had a flu vaccine. So, we vaccinate people, and then we take blood for 11 days, every single day, small amount of blood, <laughs> and we study how the immune cells react to the vaccine. We study the gene expression in those immune cells. And we study the pattern of responses in the antibodies, the proteins that protect you against the flu virus. And then we do the same studies in mice. So I'll show you a couple of the types of experiments and the types of data that we generate in the lab. This complicated slide represents gene expression profiling. So we take the white blood cells that are migrating through the blood and we purify them. And then we analyze the genes that are being expressed and we look at the genes that go up. So those are in red and the ones that go down, those are in green. It's the exact opposite of, tra of a traffic light. I've never understood why. <laughs> and we look to see which genes go up really high and which <coughs> genes go down really low. And we look for what we call a signature or a fingerprint of a gene pattern that tells us who is responding to vaccination. Each one of these columns shows four, uh, 742 genes that have gone up or gone down. Out of 35,000 genes. And this is 11 days, day zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way out to day 11 after vaccination. Each column is from a single person. And this is three years worth of data. And I have an army of people that are spectacular technicians and all but one of them over the years trained here. So you guys are getting some of the best education that will make you highly marketable in your careers. And one of my technicians, you, some of you may know, Val Sapola, is deaf. And she is one of the best technicians I have ever had. 
And I hired her not because she was deaf, but because she was good. So, what we see here is that there is a pattern that can show you who's responding to the vaccine. Now, the first two groups, this group here and this group here, we have some people that responded well to the vaccine and others that didn't seem to have a response. This is the injection vaccine. The last group got the mist. I don't know if you guys know about the mist vaccine. It's a modified flu vaccine, so the, the flu strain is very weak and it gets squirted up into your nose. So you get a very tiny flu infection, usually just in your nose. But what you see here is that the gene patterns don't really match. And in fact, the vaccine doesn't work so well. So if you're tempted to get the missed vaccine, you might not be so well protected. I have two daughters. They were really mad when I told them that <laughs> because they didn't want the shots. And they said, Dad, we don't care. We're not getting the shots. We're getting the missed vaccine anyway. So you can only do so much. <laughs> the things that we look for are patterns in the way the genes are expressed. So of course, each one of these lines here is a single gene over 11 days that's going up or going down. And now we start to use mathematics to group those genes. So if you think you can study biology without using mathematical tools or informatics <coughs> tools, um, think again, because this is really where the fun is happening. So those patterns of lines show you different groups of genes that change at the same time and that help the cells respond to vaccination. These are in B cells, the cells that make the protective antibodies. This shows you in a little more detail <coughs> about some of the mathematics and the patterns that we find. So these are groups of genes that tell us that there are cells that are making antibodies in response to the vaccine. The cluster in the middle are genes that are related to the cells migrating through the blood. And the genes at the end are related to cell division and how the cells divide. So there's this beautiful and very complex machinery inside the cells in your blood that responds to vaccination. But it's really hard to see that beauty without mathematics to make it visible. different patterns of gene expression in the lung of, uh, or the lungs of mice that have been infected with the flu. 
mice that get infected with the flu are as miserable as people who get infected with the <laughs> flu. They sneeze, these pitiful little sneezes. <laughs> they lie around in the cage. They lose some weight. And then they recover. One of the reasons that we study mice is that we can't infect people with the flu and take pieces of their lungs out to find out how to boost the immune system so that it can respond better. Once we have those patterns of genes, we can build, this looks like Facebook, right? You can call it gene book. <laughs> it's a social network of genes that go up or go down and how they're mathematically connected to each other. We use large databases of what proteins interact with each other proteins that the genes make, what genes are known to interact with each other, and then we use mathematics to construct that diagram. And that diagram allows us to identify where genes in different parts of the same pathway, in this case, genes that are associated with interferon, Interferon is uh, what's called a cytokine. It's like a um, help signal that the body sends out to the immune system to help fight lots of viral infections. So using this network, we can then identify genes that if we suppress them or boost them, will help the immune system fight the flu infection much faster. We couldn't see the beauty of this without the mathematics of this. So we make computer models. They're not as snazzy as video games, but they allow us to ask what if questions. What if we had a drug that did this? What if we could prevent the flu virus from making this protein which interferes with how the body responds to the immune system? So that computer model lets us do experiments inside the computer. So then you would think, okay, success is when your model works, right? Your model repeats exactly those same patterns. And then you do an experiment and you predict how those patterns might change. And your model works, right? What happens most of the time? Your model doesn't work. <laughs> Models are the most useful when they don't work. Why is that? Because it tells you that the world doesn't work the way you thought it did. So you've got to go back and think again. The model tells you when you're wrong. And that's a really useful thing. Actually, reality told you, nature told you when your model was wrong. The world didn't work the way you thought it did. That's, for me, part of the fun of science. You get pulled out of your shell by nature.
We're also interested in the cells and how they divide and how they respond to the flu. So this is a flow chart that we turn into differential equations or we simulate each and every little cell and how they divide and how they combine to make an immune response. This kind of science allows us to ask, can we accelerate a good immune response? And how much would we need to accelerate? So this is multi-level modeling. Now we do the experiments in the laboratory to gather the data. We label the cells. Next slide, Gigi. And we use something called flow cytometry. So flow cytometry allows you, do you guys know about flow cytometry? Nope? Okay. So flow cytometry is a way of figuring out what types of cell, uh, cells exist in your experiment dish. And you do that by labeling the proteins that allow you to distinguish between different cell types on the surface of the cell with a chemical compound that emits light when it's excited by a laser. So you can label 16 different types of markers inside and outside of the cell. And then you can ask, how is this group of cells changing when we activate them, when they divide? So this work, this particular marker on the bottom, you see that there are these striped bands. It's a dye that's taken up by the cells. And every time a cell divides in two, the amount of dye gets split equally between the daughter cells. So each one of these stripes represents a cell division. So we can see in these pictures eight or nine cell divisions. And then we can analyze the genes at each of the cell divisions by sorting the cells. And we can look at the patterns of how the cells change. These are, are technically very complicated experiments. And the expert in my laboratory is Val. The machine that does this is a three quarters of a million dollar machine, <coughs> which Val was terrified she was going to break <laughs> when she first started. Um, so that's part of the work that we do. So I told you I work on flu vaccine. This is a picture of the flu molecule. And the red spots are amino acids that differ between two flu strains. If you've been vaccinated before against the flu, sometimes you have protection against other flu strains. One of the things we do in my laboratory is look at the population level, and we've developed a test that can measure at the same time your ability to react against 50 different types of influenza. So this shows you 
what happens when uh, a mouse has been vaccinated. The different colors on the labels represent different groups of influenza strains. And this mouse was vaccinated, first infected with the flu and recovered. So that's day minus 30, and you see they don't react against anything. And then day zero, they were infected with this type of flu. And this scale, the, the redder the uh, box, uh, the higher the level of protection, the antibody level that the mouse made. And you can see not only is it protected against the um, strain it was infected against, but this is the strain that we vaccinated it against, which was related. That picture that I showed you showed the relationship between the two strains. And you can see it's protected against both, but after the vaccine, the mouse has protection against the entire class of those viruses. We can now use this method, next slide, to ask how people's reactivity against the flu changes when they're able to react against 17, 40, 50 different strains of flu. That simple ball and stick diagram uses beautiful mathematics to plot in two dimensions where somebody started with a vaccine in terms of their reactivity and where they ended. And just like we clustered or grouped those gene expression patterns, we can group the patterns of how people respond to influenza and how they're protected. And now we can work on predicting what kinds of vaccines we need to extend the protection. One of the beautiful things about this assay is that we can measure influenza reactivity for 300 people a day. So one of the projects that we're starting in the lab is looking at 3,000 people, all different areas of the city, and asking how are they protected against influenza. I'm going to switch gears now and show you how we've used the same mathematics to look at people in the hospital. So you've seen networks and graphs. One of the things as I was teaching myself about these graphs uh, that I learned was that the mathematics for grouping similar gene expression patterns together and similar reactivity to the flu are the same mathematics that you use for social, drawing social networks. So then we move from molecules to populations. And I asked, could we find people in the hospital that come into the hospital very sick, they go to the intensive care unit, they get better and go to a regular medical floor, but then they get sicker while they're in the hospital and have to go back to the intensive care unit. And those people have a much higher chance 
of dying in the hospital. So we'd want an easy way to identify them and to figure out, to predict whether they're getting better or not. So we made graphs. Each of these little dots represents a place in the hospital. It doesn't have to be the same place. The number under the graph tells you how many people out of 35,000 people that visited the hospital over one month had that kind of pattern. So the simplest patterns are lines. You go to the emergency room and you go home. So that's the first one, 17,000 people. But then you start to see those loops. Those loops are people who are very, very sick. 95% of them went to the intensive care unit and then they left and then they went back. This uses the same mathematics that we use to group gene expression. But we're doing this for a whole hospital. Now it turns out that with those mathematics, you can draw a social network diagram that represents the entire hospital. This is how floors in the hospital are connected to each other. It is a little confusing. But of course, we have mathematics to sort out that confusion. So one of the things that we can do with this kind of mathematics is we can look at how people move through the hospital, where they go when they're in the hospital, and we can predict what happens to the hospital when there are uh, epidemics or infections that are going between units. Right? People get sick in the hospital sometimes. And it's the same beautiful mathematics that we used to generate those gene expression networks. This is sort of a list of all the paths and things that I thought I wanted to be <laughs> and that I've had the privilege of doing. And I did stay within sort of science and medicine, except for the philosophy part. <laughs> but I even did philosophy of science yes. and philosophy of medicine. I did medical ethics for a while. So I guess part of what I want to tell all of you is don't be so bound by what you think you want to do. Be open to zigging and zagging and really find something that you're really interested in. You really want to know how something works. That something may change. I started out with bone and ended up with whole hospitals. But I feel very fortunate because I've gotten to do what I love through way too many years now. I won't tell you how many years it was since I was sitting where you guys are. <laughs>
have gotten to choose parts of our path. So, I'm happy to ask to answer questions. Thank you for your attention. I hope you found something interesting. <laughs>